Good morning and welcome to our service. Lovely to have you with us. We're going to make a little start uh, as we worship the Lord together by turning to our first hymn this morning, 711 in Songs of Victory, if you're using a hymn book. Otherwise, the words would be projected above my head. Thou hast snapped my fetters, thou hast made me free, liberty and gladness I have found in thee. Let's stand to sing, please. Let's bow together in a little word of prayer, and as we do so, we want to remember uh, the tough family. Uh, Jimmy is with us this morning. Uh, his father was called home uh, to be with the Lord there on Wednesday, and uh, was buried there on uh, Friday, and it was great uh, to be there and to hear um, Ernest Tough preach Um, a very straight uh, gospel message. Uh, So we want to pray for the Tough family and for James in particular. And uh, we also want to remember uh, Leonard, uh, sorry, not Leonard, uh, Philip Leonard, uh, Leonard's father. Um, Philip Leonard um, is engaged to Ruth Wallace and uh, they're going to be getting married on the 30th of the month. Uh, here in the church. We were having a practice here uh, last night for that. Uh, Well, Philip's dad uh, was admitted into hospital last night, and so uh, we want to pray uh, for his dad and for Philip and for the whole family circle as well. So let's unite together in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you Uh, for the opportunity to be together again. Lord, for this uh, opportunity to gather into this house uh, on the Lord's day to worship. 
uh, Lord, to praise, to give thanks, to fellowship one with another, to sit under your word. We thank you, Lord, for your blessings bestowed upon us uh, already today, and we pray uh, that you would multiply those blessings throughout the day, that we might know your presence. Lord, we might know your peace. We might indeed know the speaking voice of God and, Lord, the the workings of the Spirit in our midst and in our hearts. And, Lord, as we are bowed before you, we want to come and we want to bring uh, the tough family to you. We thank, Lord, of their loss at this time. Uh, But we are thankful uh, that, Lord, Harold Tough uh, put his faith and trust in you. And uh, Lord, though he left it uh, to a late hour, we thank you uh, that, Lord, he left that testimony behind even for over a decade here now, uh, that he was born again of your spirit. And Lord, we know that you've taken him home. And we know that uh, James here has that comfort Uh, Lord, knowing that he is today uh, in your near presence. And we do pray for James, and we pray that, Lord, you will draw nigh to him and that you will comfort him in this time of loss. That, Lord, you will undertake for him, that you will be with him, that, Lord, he might know your all-sufficiency at this time. We are mindful, Lord, of the funeral service there on Friday past. We are mindful, Lord, of that message that was brought by your servant there. Lord, a very straight message. A message, Lord, uh, that was to the point. A challenging message. And we thank you for his faithfulness. Uh, Lord, how he was even asked uh, to preach uh, at that funeral service. And Lord, we pray for those who were there. Uh, who do not know you, who heard, Lord, uh, that it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment, that, Lord, those, those words would continue to ring in their ears, that, Lord, they might uh, indeed be conscious uh, that life at best is a very brief. Indeed, that they, Lord, might... Uh, as we think of some of them, Lord, they're, they're not uh, young. Uh, and uh, we pray that uh, they would think of their latter end. That they, Lord, would indeed seek to be made right with God, even through our Lord Jesus Christ. And for any Lord that might have resisted that message, we pray that the Holy Spirit would indeed work mightily upon them. That, Father, prayers would be answered And that there would be those, Lord, uh, in glory even as a result, Lord, of that particular service. Lord, we're also mindful of uh, Philip's uh, dad here, uh, how he was admitted into hospital last night. And Lord, you know uh, how serious the matter is. Uh, Lord, you know uh, uh, how... Uh, this will have had an impact upon Philip and uh, the whole family circle. And Lord, we pray uh, that uh, they might indeed all hope in God, that they might indeed uh, see the Lord touching him, uh, restoring him uh, to good health. Uh, Lord, that he might uh, soon be discharged and that he, Lord, would have the opportunity Uh, and the strength, uh, Lord, to be here uh, on the 30th, uh, even to see his son. Uh, Lord, uh, make his vows as he uh, would marry our Ruth, Lord. And so we commit uh, him to you. We commit the whole family to you. We pray that, Lord, you will undertake for them and uh, that, Lord, you will be with each and every one. Father, we commit ourselves into your hands. Again, we pray for those, Lord, who are not here. Uh, Lord, due to advanced years, due to health reasons, uh, Lord, perhaps 
uh, even because they are away at this time. We pray that, Lord, you would draw nigh to all, that all might indeed know that you are God, that all, Lord, might know your blessing in, your, in their lives, that all, Lord, might indeed know uh, that, uh, that you are with them and that you are for them, that you will never leave them nor forsake them. Indeed, we pray that they might be acutely aware of your loving presence today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we're going to sing again, and uh, we're turning back to Songs of Victory, uh, 341. 341. Again, the words will be projected above my head here. Uh, A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. We'll stand to sing, please. Bibles with you. We're turning back to 1 Kings and chapter 17 this morning. (coughs) 
First Kings in chapter 17. We're going to read from verse 8 through to verse 16. And we read, And the word of the Lord came unto him, that's Elijah, saying, Arise, get thee to Sarephath, which belongeth to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a, a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Sarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not. Go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruse of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not. Neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. Ending our reading there. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you again for our time together this morning. We thank you, Lord, for another opportunity, not only to uh, worship, to praise, and to give thanks, but, Lord, for this opportunity to look at your word, to consider uh, this passage. Indeed, we thank you, Father, uh, for this new series that we've, been, that we've started, uh, Lord, on the life and the ministry of your servant, Elijah. We thank you, Lord, for the challenge uh, of it. We thank you, Lord, for your speaking voice. We thank you, Lord, for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for all that you have said and done already uh, as we have been looking at his life and ministry. And Father, we pray uh, that you would continue to speak that you would continue, Lord, to challenge and to encourage, to give hope even unto your people. Through this message this morning, indeed I pray for your help. I ask, Lord, for the the enablement of the Holy Spirit to share with your people. Indeed I pray that he, Lord, would apply these things to every heart and mind. And that, Father, we might say as we leave this place, it was good for us to be there today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, as we continue this uh, little series in the life and the ministry of Elijah, I want, to consider, <clears throat> I want to consider how the Lord provided for his servant after the brook Cherith dried up, in a place called Sarafath. In fact, I, I want to consider how he miraculously provided for him through a poor widow woman 
who was literally, literally scraping the bottom of the barrel to provide one last meal for herself and her son. And as we consider these things together, I want you to know that our loving Heavenly Father is also able to provide for you today, no matter what you are facing in your life at this moment in time. And who knows, he may even do so through others who do not know the Lord as yet, as was the case here. And so I want to begin then this morning by considering, first of all, a fresh path. A fresh path. And three things uh, as we think about the fresh path here. First of all, the command. The command. When the brook dried up, the Lord commanded Elijah to go to Sarephath, a town on the Mediterranean coast between the ancient cities of Tyre and Sidon. Today it lies, I understand, buried beneath the modern uh, fishing village of Sarafand, if that's how you say it, in, in Lebanon. In fact, he was commanded to trek. He was commanded to trek approximately, they say, 100 miles to a town in a territory controlled by Ahab's father-in-law, Ethbeel. And if you can remember, uh, Ethbeel means Beel is alive. If we were to put it another way, we could say that he was commanded to trek 100 miles through a drought through the drought-stricken land of Israel to a town in a drought-stricken land, the drought-stricken land of the Phoenicians, which was, by the way, uh, the homeland of uh, the wicked Queen Jezebel, who will become more important or will become uh, a more prominent figure, I should say, as we go on through the scriptures here. And of course, of her monstrous religion of Baal worship. Now, why? Why was he commanded to go to Sarephath? Well, for several reasons, including hiding him in, we might say, Jezebel's own backyard. For it seems to me that neither Ahab nor his wife Jezebel thought of looking for him there. They searched everywhere else. And you may, we see that very clearly in chapter 18 and verse 10 there. They went and they looked for him in different nations, different lands, couldn't find him, and made the people of the land take an oath to swear that he wasn't there. But they never looked for him here in Sarephath. And I'm inclined to think that this reason alone never mind the others that we will think about in a moment or two, shows us the wisdom of God. Shows us that God's wisdom far exceeds all human understanding and knowledge. I would think that if Elijah had his way, he would have gone anywhere else other than Sarephath. He would have gone anywhere else that, rather than going to some place near Sidon from where Jezebel came. But the Lord in His wisdom, in His understanding, directed Him there, commanded Him to go there in order to hide Him. And so we have here the command. Secondly, then, I want us to consider the challenge. Now, when the Lord commanded him to go to Sarephath, 
He told them, we're told there in verse 9, dwell there. Dwell there. That is, remain there until he was told otherwise. He was to remain there until he was told otherwise. He was to dwell there among the Baal worshippers of that time until he was given new directions. What's more, he was told that a, a widow woman a widow woman uh, would sustain him there. For the Lord had commanded her to sustain him. Now, that was quite an ask. That was quite an ask. For not only was she an unclean Gentile, remember that was the mindset of the Jewish people. They considered to be the Gentiles, uh, the Gentiles to be unclean. Which, by the way, I personally believe that being fed by an unclean raven or ravens, it helped him to obey that command. Not only was she an unclean Gentile, but she was also a widow. A widow. Who in those days was among the poorest of the poor? In fact, they were normally the first to die off in times of drought. For they had no means of support as we have today uh, with our benefit system. In those times, they didn't have that. Bar if you were a, a Jew, there were provisions made in the law of Moses where you had to consider and think about widows in the land, but those same provisions, those same provisions did not exist outside of Israel. And here Elijah is being told to go to Sarephath, which belongs to Sidon. He's told to go to a land outside of Israel to a poor widow woman who can hardly feed herself. That was a challenge to dwell in that land, to look to the Lord to feed him, to look after him, to care for him through this woman who was literally scraping the barrel in order to survive. As such then, for Elijah, Sarephath would live up to his name as he looked to the Lord to provide his needs through this poor widow woman, for his faith in God would be refined in that place. You see, the word sarafath means refinement. And so he was going to a place, he was being sent to a place where he, his faith in God was going to be refined. Of course, we often think, and we still think, no doubt, that Elijah was a mighty man of God, and yes, he was. But that didn't just happen overnight. And as part of the process of making him a man of God, the Lord had to teach him certain things. The Lord had to work, be it, the Lord was at work even in his life. And even here in Sarephath, that is what he was doing for his servant, refining him. And there are times and, and there are places where the Lord is doing the same in our lives. He's seeking to refine us, to make our faith purer to make us stronger in our faith. And that's what was happening here. And so as we think about this fresh path, there was a command to go somewhere that he, he didn't want to go, wouldn't have chosen to go. There was also the challenge of dwelling in that land. He wasn't just to pass through it, but he was to dwell in it, remain there, until the Lord spoke to him again. 
and redirected his path. And he was to dwell with a widow woman who couldn't feed herself. And then we have the comfort here. Now, as soon as Elijah received this commandment, he immediately rose. You don't read of any hesitation here. He immediately rose and he went to Sarephath and he went trusting. He went trusting in the promise of God that a widow woman would sustain him there. And that's why I chose that last hymn, Standing on the Promises of God, My Savior. I want you and I need myself to stand upon the promises of God. And here's Elijah, and he's gone with the promise of God that a widow woman in Sarephath would feed him. Well, we see there in verse 10 that when he came to the gate of the city, the town of Sarephath, that he was greatly comforted. To see the widow woman in question there. Who in the providence of God happened to be at the gate gathering sticks when he got there? In fact, the author of 1 Kings and of 2 Kings, now we don't know who the author was, but Jewish tradition says it was Jeremiah. We don't know that for certain. We can't, in fact, it's doubtful that it was Jeremiah. But Jewish tradition would say that it was him. Whoever it was, the author here emphasizes the providence of God. For he says there in verse 10, Behold, or lo, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. Our God is a providential working God. And he is at work in all of our lives, working behind the scenes, bringing about his purposes, uh, even for your good, as I've said before, and for his glory. Now, we don't know how he, how he knew that she was the widow woman of whom the Lord spoke. But it seems obvious to me that the Lord somehow impressed upon him that she was the vessel that the Lord had chosen to sustain him there. Maybe the Lord spoke to him, we're not told, but he knew. He knew this is the woman. And he was comforted, for the Lord had kept his promise. So we have a fresh path. Secondly, I want us to consider a fantastic promise. And again, I've got three little thoughts I want to share with you as we think about the fantastic promise. First of all, consider her desperate situation. Parched of thirst after his, his arduous trek, Elijah asked this dear woman for some some water to drink. Which, amazingly, in a time of drought, she was more than willing to get him. However, when he called after her to bring him a morsel of bread, a little bit of bread, with the water that she had gone to get, she was unable to get him any, for she, for she had nothing baked. Nothing baked. The word kek in verses 12 and 13 comes from a Hebrew word that means baked. So there was nothing baked in the house. All she had was ingredients. And very little at that. But worse still, she only had enough in her larder to make one final meal, 
One final meal for herself and her son. In fact, she was about to bake a little bread for herself and her son, after which she expected to lie down and die of starvation. So she told Elijah as much. As a matter of fact, she assured him that such was the case. As the Lord thy God liveth, she said, as the Lord thy God liveth, she recognized that Elijah was an Israelite. Perhaps by the way he dressed, perhaps by the way he spoke. But she recognized that he was an Israelite, and she says, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake. But a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise, and behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. That was a desperate situation this dear woman found herself in. Now, I don't know what your situation is what situation you might might be facing this morning. Some I do, some I don't. But no matter how desperate it is, I want you to know that the Lord knows about it. And the Lord cares. And the Lord is able to meet that need. It was a desperate situation. But then notice then a demand. On hearing her plight... Elijah told her not to fear. Fear not, he said. Fear not. Oftentimes we're gripped by fear, aren't we? When our back's against the wall, when we don't know what to do. But in hearing her plight, he told her not to fear, knowing that the Lord had everything in hand. And then he made a demand. He made a demand that on first reading sounds very cold and harsh. For he told her, he told this poor widow woman who was about to prepare her last meal to fix him something first before fixing something for herself and her son. No, why? Why? to encourage her, to encourage her to act in faith on the promise of God. For he said, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. In other words, you don't need to fear. You do not need to fear, for the Lord will honor your obedient sacrifice by providing for you, your son, and for me in a miraculous way as long as this drought continues. He made this demand. As I said, it sounds cold. Feed me first before you feed yourself, before you think of your son. Feed me first because he knew the promise of God and he wanted her to act in faith on the promise of God. And so then we come to a decision. This poor woman who knew very little about the Lord, remember she was a Gentile, possibly a Baal worshiper herself. Certainly she was surrounded by pagans. This poor woman knew very little about the Lord being a Gentile, but she had to make a decision. She had to decide for herself whether she could trust the Lord or not to keep his promise. After all, it was a big ask. Take what I've got left here. 
and feed the stranger before I think about myself and my son. But what does she have to lose? For if things didn't change, and they weren't about to change any time soon, we know that this drought lasted for at least another two years. If things didn't change soon, she and her son were going to die in a way of starvation. Well, it seems here that she didn't think twice about it. She didn't think of the cost. For she went, we're told in verse 15, and did according to the saying of Elijah. That is, she fixed him. She, she made him something to eat first. And then she fixed herself and her son something to eat. Now, just think about that for a moment or two. For it would have taken great faith. Great faith. To sacrifice your last meal in the belief that a God who you hardly knew would provide for you and your son as well. In fact, just think about the faith that she exercised through the, throughout the whole process. For it would have taken faith to light the fire. Remember, she had been gathering sticks. It would have taken faith to light that. It would have taken faith to mix the ingredients, the flour and the oil. It would have taken faith to bake the bread. Imagine as she's baking that bread and she gets the waft of that freshly baked bread. It would have taken faith. And then it would have taken faith to have, to have given that bread to, to this stranger whom she'd only just met in the hope that she could do it again for herself and her son, bar maybe light the fire. Folks, sometimes our faith in God will call on us to do the unthinkable so that we might receive the impossible. I like that quote. Sometimes our faith in God will call on us to do the unthinkable so that we might receive the impossible. And so as we work through this passage, we've thought about um, a fresh path. There was a command, go to Sarephath. We thought about the challenge there. Dwell there and a widow woman will provide for you. And we thought about the comfort, how that the Lord did indeed uh, provide a widow woman for him, to look after him, to feed him. And then we thought about a fantastic promise, and we thought about a desperate situation. She was abjectly poor. She was impoverished. She had nothing. She was scraping the bottom of the barrel. And then we had this demand Feed me before you feed yourself. And that demand, remember, was uh, it was made because he knew the promise of God. And she, he wanted her to exercise faith in the promise of God. And she obeyed. She chose to do what she was asked to do. And so we come then finally and quickly to a fabulous provision. A fabulous provision. Three very simple little things. First of all, the grace of it. The grace of it. This Gentile woman, this Gentile widow woman found grace in the sight of the Lord. She found grace in the sight of the Lord. For Jesus tells us, In Luke chapter 4, verses 25 and 26, if you want to look it up for yourself, Jesus tells us that Elijah was sent unto her. 
and not to the numerous widows that were in Israel at the time. There were other widows in the land of Israel. The Lord could have sent Elijah to them. But he didn't. He sent Elijah to this Gentile. He sent Elijah to this woman who was living in enemy territory. He sent Elijah to this woman who was dwelling among the heathen, the pagans, Baal worshippers. Because she found grace in his sight. And this morning, if you're saved, you should be able to rejoice because you too have found grace in his sight. And if you're not saved, he extends his grace to you. He wants you to trust in him as well, as so many of us have here this morning. Remember, grace is undeserved, the undeserved favor of God. She never, did, she never did anything to deserve God's favor. But she found God's favor. The grace of it. Secondly, the greatness of it. The greatness of it. For a period of at least two years. Every meal was a miracle. Every meal was a miracle. In fact, the Lord worked a miracle in that barrel or pot of meal, flour. And in that cruise, or jug of oil, for every day, for a period of at least two years, he replenished. He replenished what she used daily. Every day that she went back to that barrel of meal, every day that she went back to that cruise of oil, it was as if it had never been used. The Lord continued to meet her need, her son's need, Elijah's need, day after day after day. Now, he didn't give her in superabundance, but he met her daily need. Now, it has been suggested, by the way, that perhaps if he had to fill that barrel, if he had a, if he had a filled uh, that jug to the brim with oil, that there's a good possibility that there might not have been any of it left at the end of the day, or perhaps even at the end of the week. Now, why? Well, when people are starving of hunger, if they get a sense, a sniff that there's food somewhere, they'll go looking for it and they'll take it by force if they have to. And if, if, if word had it got out that, that her house was full of flour and full of oil, there's a good possibility that others in Sarafath and maybe beyond would have come and ransacked her house and maybe even killed her and her son and maybe have tried to kill Elijah as well. And so again, we see the Lord's wisdom here. He's just giving to her daily what she needs. Of course, the Lord is able to provide for our daily needs. No matter how difficult things might be, he's able to provide. And one final little thought, the glory of it. Every day, the widow woman, her son, and Elijah looked to the Lord to meet their needs. Every day. And every day they glorified him for doing so. It doesn't say that, but I think we can read that into the, the text. They glorified him for doing so, especially as people. Especially as people lay dead and dying all around them. Remember, there had been a drought in the land for at least a year This drought was going to last for three and a half years in total. And I'm sure that they glorified God for his provision. They magnified him. They praised him. They thanked him as they saw one die and then another die all around them. But God provided for them. Now, 
In fact, I'm inclined to think that this Gentile woman and her son glorified the Lord for the grace that they had found in his sight. Why me, Lord? Why have I found grace in your sight? Oh, thank you, Lord. And for showing them that what Baal could not do, the Lord was able to do. Remember, God was a God of, uh, not sorry, Baal was a God of fertility and of rain. At least that was the belief. And he was not able to provide for those who were dying in this famine. But God he was able to provide for this woman who found grace in his sight. He was able to provide for his servant through her. And we praise and we glorify him this morning for what he did for her, for her son and for his servant. For it assures us that if he could do it for her, he can do it for us. He's able, folks. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. Trust him. Stand on his promises. He'll keep them. He'll fulfill them. Let's turn on our hymn book. Redemption hymnal this time as we close. Five hundred and fifty three. Five hundred and fifty three in Redemption Hymnal. Focusing here, certainly in the first verse, on faith. Give me the faith which can remove and sink the mountain to a plain. Give me the childlike praying love which longs to build thy house again. Thy love. Let it my heart pour power and all my simple soul devour. Give us the faith to believe and to stand on the promises of God. Let's stand, please. Give me the child. 
Father, we thank you again for your word. We thank you, Lord, for speaking to us through it, for challenging us, encouraging us. And Lord, I pray, giving us hope. Lord, give us faith that can remove and sink the mountain to a plain. Help us, Lord, to stand upon the promises of God, to believe God, to trust in God, even to provide for our daily needs. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.